Yeah, okay. Good evening. We back after Pesach. Baruch Hashem b'Shal Tova. And we continue our Talmud series. I believe we are in number 32, maybe 33, but we already progressing pretty well. We are in Masechet Sota. And uh, if you remember, before we went on a Passover vacation, we were speaking about we were speaking about someone who start doing a mitzvah not for the sake of heaven and eventually it becomes for the sake of heaven why because we have a rule in the torah that uh, uh, the heart is following the actions not like many people thinking that the actions are going after the heart's desire. If the heart desires something specific, then a person is willing to do it. If he doesn't like it, then he won't do it. That's also true. But the way it really is, if a person doesn't like some food or certain thing, if he will force himself to do it for X amount of time, one, two, three months, Eventually, not only he would like to do it, he will fall in love with that. And you can see, you can take mitzvah that it's hard for you to do, you may not like it, whatever the case may be, you focus, you be consistent, you do it constantly, every day or every month, whatever it takes, and then you see after a while, not only you're not suffering from it, you're beginning to love it more and more. This is what Chazal say, Achareya peulot nimshachim alevavot. That was the end of Masechet Nazir. That just before we started Masechet Sotah in the last shiur, Amarav le'olam ya'asok adam batorah u'ba mitzvot. Always a person should be busy with Torah and mitzvot. Afilu shalol lishma. Even if they give him money to learn. Even if he does it because he want to marry this girl. Even if he does it because he's embarrassed from the neighbors. Or whatever the reason is. It's not a pure reason. Mitoch shelo lishma, because if it starts like that, eventually it becomes pure. That's how we ended up. Then, uh, we, one more thing we said in the last shiur, if a person see a woman that her husband is suspecting her that she cheated on him, what they used to do in the time of the Bet HaMikdash, they used to take the woman to Bet HaMikdash, to the Kohen. And the Kohen writes the name of Hashem on a special card, like a mezuzah, and they put it inside the water, and the ink is uh, basically going into the water, and the water becomes dark. The woman drinks this water. If she cheated, her wound explodes to pieces, and she dies. If she did not cheat, uh, if she did not cheat, then the Kohen gives her a blessing, and she has righteous boys, which is a great award for it, because she was innocent, and they suspected her. Obviously, if a husband suspects his wife, she's already not innocent. A kosher woman, he can never get to a situation that her husband will suspect her for cheating. If he got to a point that the husband already thinking, where my wife and what is she doing, that means something is not kosher in their marriage or in their relationship. Because I know kosher couples, it's not even a possibility even to, to think about it. You understand? But uh, it got to a point that he's thinking she was with another man in a closed room or whatever, or he gave her a ride in a car, and who knows what, that's it. So in the old days, they had a solution for it. You see the miracle in front of your eyes. So the Gemara say now something that we didn't know. What did we, didn't, we didn't know? If you see a woman, sota means she went off the derech. Listos, stia means off the way. You know, on the, on the right track, oh, you got off the track. That's called Sota. Bekil Kula, when she made whatever she did, Yazir Atzmo Minayayim. It's a hint to you that you have to stop drinking wine. Why? What makes a woman go and make a scene with another man? Usually it's wine. That's how it starts. Glass of wine. Now, the, the wine today, it's like water. It's not so strong. You need four or five cups until you're really affecting you. But in their time, the wine was more than 50% alcohol. It still had the pieces of grape in it. If a person drink wine, like in the old days, that's it. It's dizzy after one cup. 
That's how they used to kill people. Before they killed them, they used to they give them one glass of wine, and the people drink it in a beidin. After the, the beidin, the Jewish court found them guilty of a crime that they deserve to be executed. Before they executed them, they make them drink this wine. So they didn't know what's going to be. So the judge, they say, Savri Maranan, what's the decision of the judges, of the rabbis? So the, uh, the representative of the Beidin of the court used to announce Lamavet to death, and he drinks, they take him and they kill him, and he doesn't feel anything. Why? He's completely dizzy already. He drank this wine, they basically taking him, and that's it. Today, since we use the wine for mitzvot, such as Kiddush, that's why we say in Kiddush, Savri Maranan, and everyone say Lechaim, the opposite, to, the, to life. That's the reason why we say, yeah, I, always, I never understood why Ashkenazim only say Savri. Savri who? I forgot the second. I don't know, I mean, it's hard for me to understand how he became Savri. It has to be Savri Maranan, or Savri Rabanan. Somebody. Because savri, it's a decision. What do you sover? What do you decide? What do you, what do you hold of? That's your decision, okay? So, this is where we ended up last time. Also, we said that a person received his wife based on his behaving. If he is becoming holy, they're going to find him a holy woman. If he's a person who's val chesed, he likes to help others, Hashem, find him the right woman. If he's a person that uh, teach. He's going to find him a wife that she will support his teaching. And if he's a person who likes to go to casino and smoke uh, drugs, he'll find him a wife with tattoo and hearing here in her nose and all kinds of things. And she also likes uh, some drugs and alcohol. And her children, she doesn't know where they are. She forgot them in a uh, six flag. She already arrived to Manhattan. She, she forgot that she had two kids with her. That can, you know, that's who you are. That's what you get. Don't be surprised. This is it. Now, let's start. And of course, I covered it briefly. There was a whole an hour and a half we spoke about all these subjects. If you missed it, go to the previous session. Now we're still in Masechet Sota. Amar Rabbi Yonatan. Kol ha'oseh mitzvah achat ba'olam hazeh. Every person who does one mitzvah in this world. Mekadmato ve'olechet lefanav la'olam haba. When you come to the next world, you're going to see this mitzvah walking in front of you. Like a king comes, all the soldiers come and they drive in front of him, like a president, there's always many cars before. The president is not the first car. There's many before him to show him the way, to welcome him. This mitzvah is walking in front of you. Now, how a mitzvah walks in front of you? We are not talking a mitzvah. We're talking the angel that was created from this mitzvah. Now we're learning a new concept here. What's the concept? Every mitzvah a person does create an angel. Every sin he does create a bad angel. When the time comes the, for the trial to begin, you look on your right, it's all the good angels that you created. You look at the left, it's all the bad angels you created. Some people, that's how it's going to be. Five trillion black angels, Two and a half good angels. He put filin in his bar mitzvah, that's it. You know? Oh, what happened? The good angel wants to say, Your honor, my client is a tzaddik. You hear five trillion bad angel. Boo! Chatsuf, you, you have the nerve to say it's good? Let's see. Each one of us was created in a different date. Comes the first angel. I was created April 12. Two o'clock. In the afternoon, what? He sat in a restaurant, ate bread without washing his hands. Comes another angel. I created a minute after. Ate bread without a bracha. Come another angel. What? I was created right after. What? Got up from the table without making birkat amazon. Shit. Goes on the street. Another one and another one. Multiplied by seven years and you know how many. It sounds like uh, metaphoric, but it's 100% real and legit. That's exactly how it is. However, there is one way out of it, which I always say it in every one of my lectures in the last year. If you made one Jew religious, all his mitzvot create angels for you as well, to your good side. 
and he has kids, their mitzvot creates good angels for you. And then you made another one religious, you created another pyramid. Him, his children, his grandchildren, grand-grandchildren. So they supply you with lots of defenders. You understand? That's why the Torah says that Kiruv, saving souls, is the most uh, productive mitzvah that a Jew can do. Or oh, God forbid, if you, if you ruin a soul, nothing can be as bad as that because it's a chain reaction. You pay for everything, unfortunately. So, Shneemar, how do we know it? The prophet Isaiah, Yeshaya, 58, this is what he says, Ve'alach lefanecha tzitkecha, Kvod Hashem yasfecha. Your righteousness is walking in front of you, and Hashem is picking, picking them up. Oh, one by one, which is good, very good. So if somebody does a teshuva, can debate... Can the oh, uh, obviously we repeated that many times in the past. Everything I ever said, everything I will ever say, every punishment I ever mentioned from the Torah, every restriction or, or, uh, or anything that the Torah takes against the wicked people are all subject to tshuva. If a person made real repentance, if you want to know how to make tshuva, watch my six lecture series, Laws of Repentance. Recently we posted it on the website, six lectures. Soon it's going to be on a CD another week or two. You're going to be able to hear everything in one shot, MP3. So it's explaining from A to Z how to make repentance to all sins you ever made. Serious, not as bad. Not learning, yes learning, all the Shabbos, this, Lashonara, everything. The answer to all questions that you may have about tshuva is right there. If a person really does real tshuva, all these bad angels are erased. One and another one and another one. There's no record of them in your file. What happened that day? Nothing. If you reach a very high level of tshuva, which means everything you do, you do out of love to Hashem, nothing out of fear, then the sins that you made become mitzvot. Not only that angels erased, they move to the positive side, which is much better. You understand why, right? If you erase them, as one achievement. You had a billion bad angels against you, one by one you erase them. Every day, tshuva, tshuva, vidui, chatati, yom kippur, less and less you know, are, are, are left. But if it's tshuva me'ahava, they move to the positive side. But I don't want anyone here to dwell or to hallucinate that his tshuva is from love, because you can count on one or two hands in a whole generation how many people really made tshuva from love. Tshuva from love means that you never ever consider the possibility of a punishment. None of the things you do is because you're afraid to lose your parnasa or your health or your wealth or, or, your, or your future wife or your existing wife or your children or the children that you don't have or you're afraid to get fired and all, et cetera, et cetera. We are all full of calculation. What's in it for me? What's in it not for me? And that doesn't make it a pure tshuva. Tshuva me'ahava means crystal pure. Why you become religious? I love Hashem. I'm ashamed how I used to behave. I can't believe that the things I was doing. I regret. I want to I wanna do more and more to make Hashem happy. I want to be a faithful son. Punishment, even if Hashem tells me, you are protected. There's no punishment for you. I love you so much. I love your grandfather. Your grandfather was David Amelech. I don't know what. You cannot get punishment. I would still keep all the mitzvot without any problem. That's called tshuva me'ahava. From my experience, after 15, 16 years by now, of meeting thousands of Baalei tshuva, I tell you, I can count on one, maximum two hands, how many made tshuva from ahava, real pure tshuva. All of us thinking about what's going to be if. If I will die like this, I'm finished. I have no chance to the world to come. I'm going to hell. I'm going to kafakela. I'm going to suffer hundreds of years for all my sins. Right away, I say, I better wake up before it's too late. That's tshuva out of fear. Most people have a healthy combination of love and fear. 
which is very good, it's a high level of tshuva. Not that it's only fear. Only fear not going to work. A person can, is, is going to kill himself in the end. It's going to break him down. That's it. It's a combination of love and fear. Yes, he loves Hashem. He appreciates Him. He wants to make Him happy. He wants to be close to Him. He feels great that I just did something and I listened to Hashem and it worked out. At the same time, he's afraid of the punishments and what he's going to lose. That's normal. If you are in this level, I promise you, you're in very good shape. You're very good shape. The Gemara continue. The Gemara says like this, And everyone who makes a sin in this world, that sin is waiting for him for the judgment day. Sheneemar, in the book of Yov 6, Yelaftu orchot darkam, Yaalu batov veyovedu. All their evil way will be wrapped, like you make a lafa. You saw how the lafa, they put everything inside and they close it and now it looks sealed from the outside. All the sins are in one place and it's wrapped and it's all going to Tohu. Tohu is one of the six, seven places of hell. There are seven different categories. They Ovedu and will be destroyed there. God forbid. Rabbi Elazar Omer, Shura Kelev. A person who makes a sin with a non Jewish woman, even if she's the most righteous, righteous Gentile in history, the most righteous Gentile in history. A righteous Gentile, Hashem loves her, she has a share to the world to come according to the Goyim. And he is not a special Jew. You know, he keeps mitzvot, nothing, he's not uh, Rabbi Akiva yet. And he made a sin with her, he can never get rid of her. When he dies, it's a, it's a sign for eternity of a shame. Everywhere is going to be in the next world. Everybody know that he made that sin. And over there it's a huge, huge embarrassment. Over there all these Israeli with a ponytail and earring won't be able to brag on television that they brought some Thailandi Goya to be their girlfriend in Israel. Over there they will hide under the rug for a billion years from the embarrassment. Not because the Goya is a bad woman. Not because she's wicked. Not because, eh, I'm telling you, I'm talking a perfect Goya. Needless to say, if she's wicked or a prostitute or anything like that, that makes it a lot worse. I'm talking now a complete perfect Goya. Jews have no permission to mix with the Goyim. And Kshura Kelev. What does it mean tied to him like a dog? Why dog? Did you see these dogs that everywhere you go, they run after you, they don't leave you alone? You beg them. It happens to me a lot, unfortunately. Everywhere I go, I go to places, this, oh, all of a sudden a dog comes out. And all the time when the dogs see me, they all go, they're excited for me, they think I'm, I'm in a mood to play with them. But I'm thinking to myself, oh, Hashem just saved me, that he won't touch me physically, this dog. He can jump until tomorrow. He touched me, now I gotta put all my clothes in the laundry, I gotta go to the mikveh. It's a very impure animal. So, this is it. So that's how she... Now imagine you an important banker, important, and you have a meeting with Bill Gates. Yeah. Some business, you put your tuxedo, I don't know, the best suit, handmade, all that, beautiful, you fix your hair, this, you come with all the computer, everything, Up, all of a sudden you have a dog from the neighborhood, it's all like rotten, ugly, dirty dog, rabies, saliva is dripping from his mouth, his tail is like, He's walking like this. And everywhere you go, he stick to you. You try to push him out, he jump into your car. You come to the bank, you try to go in, he sneak in. <laughs> you you want to go in a public bathroom, Up, he, he goes in. You have to go to court, you got a ticket, Up, he walk in. The judge said, what, you crazy? You're bringing your dog to court? Your honor, it's not, I cannot get rid of him. What kind of life is this? That's only here 20, 30 years. Big deal. No, so you have a dog. Your night of your wedding, you have to break the glass, the dog jump under your leg. You smash his head. Imagine the life you have. You want to get married, you want to go on a date. You meet, uh, I don't know, Miriam. Miriam, nice to meet you. We're going on a shiduch tonight. Oh, she see you have a dog in your back. <laughs> what happened to you? You won't get married. You don't have a what kind of life. This is for eternity. One time being with a Goya. If it's two goyot, two dogs. 
50, 50 dogs. <coughs> Unless if he made real tshuva, and it's hard to make tshuva. All the sex crimes is the hardest to correct. The hardest. <coughs> and they are in almost in the worst level in Gehenom, in hell. The sixth one, six out of seven. Seven is, let's say, if you go to seven, chas v'shalom, you never come out of there. Six, you can still, six, you can still come out. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. There's an X amount of time and a person comes out clean. Seventh, all the dirt from all the six layers, all going down to the bottom. It's called Tachtit Aaretz, the bottom of earth. You don't want to go there, I promise you. Who goes there? Who goes there? Mechal el Shabbos, on purpose. Someone who knows Shabbat is holy and continue to violate it. Wasting seed and Chilul Hashem. Disgracing the name of Hashem with his yamaka or his Star David. Before he goes to rob a bank, he makes sure to put his Star David necklace. That the, whoever is going to watch him later on the camera will know a Jew robbed the bank. You understand uh, what's going on here? This is it. So, we learn it from Yosef, Yosef Atzadik, that the gorgeous, beautiful wife of Potiphar, one of the four most beautiful women ever lived, was doing everything she can to, to tempt him to, to be with her. And, Velo Shama Elea, the Torah say, he did not listen to her, Lishka Vita, to sleep with her, to be with her. Why the Torah say to sleep with her? To be with her. <laughs> if he sleeps with her, for sure he's with her. What does it mean? There's extra two words in the Torah. And there's never extra words in the Torah. What's the extra two words? Liyot ima. To be with her from now on forever. That's it. She tied to him. You go to the oral Torah. That's the secret of these two words. Lishkav olam To sleep with her physically in this world. And to be stuck with her for eternity in the next world. God forbid. Amar Rava, kol abal isha zona, every person who made a sin with a prostitute. Lebasof, mevakesh kikar lechem veeno motze. One of the punishments that is very popular to this kind of people who make sex crimes, they lose all their wealth in the end. They, that's it, they broke. What happened, Moshe? 20, 30 years, you were the master of the world. Business, gold, 47, Fifth Avenue. Well, all of a sudden, bankruptcy, people collecting money for you. What happened? This is one of the things. Usually, sex crimes take away the blessing from life. There are a few things who destroy the luck, your fortune in life. Shabbos, a person mechalel Shabbat bemezid, on purpose, it takes away all the blessing. You can make millions, no blessing. There's no pleasure come from this money. Nothing goes for doctors, for problem. They cheated him, the house, all kinds of things, strange thing. I know, I know a person, now he's Shomer Shabbat, Baruch Hashem becoming more and more tzadi, he even goes to learn. Now after he got divorced. But before he got divorced, he was married to a very wicked woman. Not evil, not a, not a bad person. You know, nice, friendly woman, but very wicked which means very corrupted in her personality, full of ego, pride, crooked, tricks, lies, you know, a sleazy person in, re, in, in the way she behaves. And what happened is, guess what? This person is married to her. She feels she's a big shot. She's a professional. One day, they went and bought a house in a very expensive town. Very expensive. <coughs> Say to him, why do you need a house, millions of dollars like this? Why do you... What for? What for? Then they decided to renovate the house. Are you crazy? Are you going to invest another half a million to renovate the house? People don't understand what, what, how much more you can do with your money than waste it on all kinds of nonsense. In the end, they didn't listen to me, of course, because she's the boss. If it was up to him, he would do it, but she does what she wants in the end. After wasting hundreds of thousands of dollars on construction, she changed her mind. She decided, she makes an extension now, she changed the whole house. She, what a project. She gets engineer, building company, everything. And then I said to him, well, are you normal? It's, uh, obviously your relationship with her is not good. You sign on a house, 
you take another mortgage and another mortgage. You're going to owe millions of dollars. When you get divorced, you're going to have to pay this. What are you? You're not controlling your wife. You're not, you have no say. After a month or two, he calls me up. Guess what happened? She didn't like the way the construction came out. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I skip one step. After she did everything, they started to fix. They're working, they're working. They're giving ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 every few days to the builders. The engineer came from town, put an X on the entire work. It's illegal. He went a little bit more than the limit. Now you have to knock down the whole extension. Wow. Oh, another month, he calls me up. Guess what happened? I show up from work, and I see my whole house disappeared. She knocked down the whole house. Almost $3 million house. And now there's two mortgages on the house. They put almost a million dollar in. Maybe I'm not exactly on the numbers, but it's more or less like this. And now they have to rebuild the whole house. Hey, lucky I got him out of here, this guy. She didn't even tell him. Imagine you have a wife, you come home, your house disappeared. <laughs> Not talking a little tiny apartment in Harlem here. We're talking a massive, massive house in a very expensive neighborhood. Oh, knock down the whole house. Ay, 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 ay. Ah, the things I saw in my 16 years dealing with the public, I can write 10 books, bestseller. <laughs> Problem is nobody will believe me when I write this story. Right. Nobody will believe. It's not, I myself sometimes asking myself, how can it be? How, how can it be? You know, I mean myself asking myself, how can it be the things that I just saw? So how to believe? Anyway, so someone who does this ended up losing his blessing, and even a piece of bread will be hard for him to get. Amara Bizrika, Amara Biel Azar. Someone who mezalzel benetilat yadaim. He puts down washing the hands before bread. Eh, Rabbi, what's, uh, I have to wash my hands every time I eat bread. My hands are clean, trust me. I keep my hand clean. I'm walking in the office. It's no problem. I came out of the bathroom half an hour ago. I washed them with soap. But again now, netila. Someone who doesn't respect netilat yadaim and do not do it properly, ne'ekar min haolam. Getting pulled out from the world. It's not something good. There is a hint on the bracha that we make. What bracha we make when we wash our hands? Asher kideshanu bemitzvotav etzivanu al netilat yadaim. Al, ayin, netilat nun, yadaim yud, ani, pur. Bring poverty. The more water you spill, the more blessing you have in your wealth. Guilt. More money. That's why sometimes if you go to a shul or somebody washes his hand and he put a whole bucket like a horse on his hand, don't think it's crazy. He's just greedy. <laughs> he wants money. <laughs> anyway, it's good. Sometimes if, if the money comes to you in a kosher way, what happened to the phone every five second phone? If the money comes to you in a kosher way, it's fine. As long as it doesn't come in a non-kosher way, then the problems begin. Amar Abichia Barashi Amar Av. All the time I mention names of few rabbis, don't be surprised, because the way of the Chachamim was always to give credit to the one who taught them. So if I say, Amar Rabichia Bar Ashi, Ravchia, the son of Rabbi Ashi, in the name of Rav, which is, he was, he was his rabbi. Sometimes the Gemara brings three names. Dim A in the name of B in the name of C. Which means C is the source. But he went to B and then he went to A. You understand? That's how it goes. So it says like this. Maim Rishonim, the first water, when you wash to eat bread, you have to pick up your head when you make a bracha. Asher Kedishan, you always make the right hand a little bit above the left. It's good, merci. And this is judgment. So you go, Asher, Kiddushan, Mitzvotam, Tzivanu, Al Netilat Yadayim, and only when you finish the bracha, you dry. Not before. Okay. Then, Maim Achronim, when a person finishes eating, he has to put very little water on his fingers. A little bit, drop of, of uh, mamash, very little. 
צריך שישפיל ידיו למטה, his hands has to be down. The Gemara says, Tanya nam yachi, we have another brighter, another Mishnah that's speaking about netilat yadayim. Someone who washes his hand, make sure to put your hand up. Right? Why? Why you have to bring your hand up? I cannot put my hands like this down, normal. Well, it has to be like this. What is it, a show in Broadway? I have to go like this. Why? Well, I, I, I wash my hands, dry, finish, no? Because when you, when you wash your hands, some of the water can go back and make your hands impure again. I don't want to start going into the halachot. But there is a situation. But if you do it like this, the water can only go down. They're not going reverse. You understand? Some of the water who touch this part can go back and make the hands tame. But if you do it like this, it's no problem. Then, Amar Rabi Abau, Amar Rava, in the name of Rava. Rava is the Chevruta of Abaye. Abaye and Rava, they buried in Sfat. I was in the grave, it's inside the cave. In Sfat, right by Yonatan ben Uziel. Amuka, or go all the way down. It's right there. Hey, you see the grave. You can't believe that you're standing next to the grave of this holiest people in history. And this is, it says, this Abba Leshet Ish, person who made a sin with a married woman. Afilu lamat Torah, even he learns Torah all his life. He's in yeshiva. All his life learned Torah. Right? No matter what, lo inakem midina shel genom. He still cannot go to heaven without paying first in hell for that sin. Why? Some sins, you cannot just go like this and it's, it's, and it's gone. No, it's just they won't go. You have to work very hard to correct what you did. Then, Rabbi Yochanan, in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, every person who yesh bo gasut ruach, every arrogant person, disrespect, ungrateful, dirty language, loud, nasty, proud, it's all a combination of arrogant, right? Someone like that, he is equal we have a concert here tonight. <laughs> he is equal to a person who worship an idol. He is equal to a person who worship an idol. Someone who is arrogant is in the same bad category like a person who bowed down to Buddha. The Rabbi Yochanan said, is like a person who does not believe in Hashem. What's the connection? If a person is nasty, is arrogant, is that a comparison to someone who says there's no Hashem, God forbid, or bound down to an idol? What, why why the, the Torah found to put both of them in the same category? Why is it? The Gemara continue. Not only that is in this bad category of idol worshippers, it's count like he made all the possible sex crimes that are mentioned in the Torah. Kol ha'arayot. Ke'ilu ba'al kol ha'arayot. Why is it? Because a part of being a believer in Hashem means to listen to Him. If you're still arrogant, if you're still loud and nasty and dirty mouth, and disrespect people, that means you don't have a munah in Hashem. If you have a munah in Hashem, you're going to behave like this? How can you behave like this? How can you behave like this if you have a munah in Hashem? That's why you're in the same category. Rabbi Chama Bar I mean, Rav said, Kol Abal Eshet Ish, a person who made a sin with a married woman. Married woman, it's not only a woman that right now live in the same house with her husband and children. That's a typical married woman. Married woman can be a woman that lived 10 years on her own. Her husband dumped her, or she dumped him. Today it's more popular, the other option. She dumped him. And they, they separated, but he doesn't want to give her a get. 10 years like this. She's alone and he's alone. He goes with his girlfriend, and now she met a guy. 
And the guy doesn't even know she used to be married. He met her tonight, they go out, whatever, and they make a scene. The poor guy and her, they are falling into this category. He thought she's a single woman. He came with her to the house. He didn't see a husband, didn't see anyone. But later he found out that she's a married woman. If she told him before that she's separated from her husband, she's a Jewish woman, and she's not divorced, only separated, and he still had relation with her, both of them has no share to the world to come. They finished. If she told him after the act, she has no share to the world to come, and he has, but he has to make a serious tshuva. Why? Because he did not know yet. That's called a very bad scene, but not intentional. That changed the whole status of the scene. But if he knew, or even suspected, because he saw pictures, imagine he goes to her house, she doesn't tell him she's married. Uh, but he see a picture for 10 years ago, when she still were very skinny and young, with a man in a wedding uniform. She see uh, she's wearing a gown. Eventually she was a kala, no? It doesn't mean, maybe she's a divorced woman. But he doesn't want to ask, better not to know, Rabbi. <laughs> you know these wise guys? You fool, what does it mean? You have to find out. Because it will ruin your entire life. If you're still not convinced that it's very serious, please begin to watch your eyes on people who went with married women. How lousy their life become after that. Check. Don't believe me. Just check. Follow them and see how many distractions come to their life from touching another man's wife. She is still connected with the soul to that man. And he went inside and got mixed. A horrible scene. Horrible. Someone who did that scene, If he was the one who were nominated to receive the Torah like Moshe, could find better title for it. He was like Moshe Rabbeinu. He brought the Torah, the Ten Commandments. And he made a scene like this. Lo shel genom. He can get clean from the punishment of hell. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Afilu oset tzedaka baseter. Even if he's a complete Baal tzedaka, he give millions to tzedaka, support yeshivot, Support orphans, support widows, give to synagogues, whatever you name it. He cannot go to heaven until he pays for that sin in hell. No forgiveness for that, unless if he made a very, very, very serious tshuva here, yeah, then he doesn't have to, because he got clean here. Amar Rabbi Elazar. Amar Rabbi Elazar. כל אדם שיש בו גסות הרוח, every arrogant person, deserved to be cut like you chop a tree from the bottom of it. You don't leave anything to it. You go as low as possible. Shh! From the foundation. Asherah, it's like a tree that used to worship an idol. The Torah says when you come to the Holy Land, destroyed all the idols of the seven nations who sit in Israel. They all worship idols. Don't just destroy it. Destroy it from the roots with the land under it. Dig inside. Few um, uh, tfachim inside. Not, not to leave any souvenir from these impure idols that they had. So someone who's arrogant, this is what he deserves to get. This kind of cutting. Kol adam sheyesh bo gasut haruach, everyone who's arrogant, and Afaron Ninar, the sand does not shake above his body. This is an expression. Let's see who is clever here. What does it mean? The sand above his body does not shake. It doesn't get up. When? When Moshiach uh, comes. Very good. Baruch Hashem. When the resurrection of the dead starts, his sand will be smooth and calm. Why he won't come out? Why arrogance? Arrogance. We're not, we're not talking murder here. We're not talking about robbing. We're not talking about Mechalel Shabbat. 
We're not talking uh, making idols. We're talking a person that is nasty. Nasty. Lashonara, cursing, all kinds of things like this. this, is, this is, what, what's gasut ruach? Gas ruach means arrogant. That's the right word in English. Disrespectful, ungrateful, chutzpah. That's what it means. Amar Rabbi Elazar. Every arrogant person, shechina meyalelet alav. HaKadosh Baruch Hu literally cry for him. What, what a low life. That's what Hashem cries. Shechina meyalelet. You know what meyalel means? Not regular crying. This crying that a person cry a minute and it's over. This is like non-stop. Ah, ah, non-stop. You know, chas v'shalom, like a person that has a real, real tragedy. For three, four hours you cannot stop. I once saw a woman that her dog got choked in the elevator. If, if I ever was able to feel how she was crying for that dog, then you'd understand what does it mean, me alelet. The poor dog, the leash got caught and the elevator went up and he got choked. And it was in the middle of a lobby in a building in Upper West Side in Manhattan. When? On Shabbat. When? After the davening. What was I doing in a building in Manhattan? Over there, the, the, the shul is inside the building. Business as usual. Cafeteria, doorman, cars, limos, going, go to work. Up, oh, and some religious people have a shul there in the building, in the first floor. You come out of the shul, you walk out, you see people coming, dogs, cars, smoking, telephone. No, no atmosphere of Shabbat. Ay, ay, ay. What else does it take that a person that hears the phone ring five times in a lecture to get his head to begin to walk, to put his phone on vibration? What does it take? I don't understand. Don't you think that your phone going to ring? Especially now when Ben Laden died. <laughs> Every five minutes, Ben Laden is dead. So I answer back, there is another billion and a half Bin Ladens waiting. <laughs> you kill one, 5,000 were born in the same minute. You can't get rid of these terrorists. You can't. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, again, but it's good because you know, what, you know what's the good part about the phone that it's ringing? In every bed there is something good. Usually it happens to the people who fell asleep. And they get so nervous because everyone looking. So right away they shake their head. Now they wake up for another half an hour. Now the person who called them got a mitzvah not even knowing. Why? Thanks to him, they learned another half an hour Torah. <laughs> you know, it reminds me about a good joke. One rabbi was giving a lecture, and everyone in front of him, you know, begin to fall asleep. So now there's two guys in the first row. One is up, and the other one is already sleeping. So he said to the one who is up, wake him up. He said, no. So wake him up. He said, you made him sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> All right, very good. All right, let's move on. Amar Marukva. Call Adam, every arrogant person, HaKadosh Baruch Hu say, God announced in the court of heaven, me and him cannot be in the same place. If he's there, I'm out of there. Right? It cannot be together. Right? Gva enayim urechav levav oto lo uchal. Usually, when the Gemara speaks about arrogant, it speaks about proud people. Proud. <coughs> Today, it's a combination of many things. It's chutzpah, it's loud, it's nasty. In those days, people were not nasty. Everyone had respect. When I was a kid, it was very difficult to find nasty people. I'm telling you. About uh, 35, 40 years ago, people had manners. Even the non-religious people. A woman got on a, on a bus, pregnant, half of the bus asked her to sit. An old man gets, right away, everyone wants to help him. Here, sit, here, sit, there. A blind person wants to cross the street. He has a line behind him. Right? Everyone wants to help him to cross the street. Today, nobody cares about anyone. Everyone is busy with his life, egoistic, and finished. The world has changed. There's no warm relationship between people like it used to be, with all the media and the Facebook. Everything became technological. 
There's no relationship. Soon you marry your wife through the Facebook and you never see her physically. Who is she? Your wife. Where is she? She's in Honolulu. So we, we married through the Facebook. We married. That's what's happening today. So all the shopping is done from the computer now. You, you press a few buttons, up. Two hours later, the delivery guy brings everything to your home. If you're a good customer, they choose the best in a supermarket. Everything, clothing, this, jewelry, whatever you need. If your business is from work, you don't have to ever leave the house. You, get, you, have, you have everything in your home today, but there's no relationship. People don't know how to handle each other. You want to get married. No, how are you going to get married? You're a robot. You grew up with computer in your veins. You know how many phone calls I get from wives that are frustrated from their addicted husband to the computer? Finally get home 8 o'clock at night until 1, 2, sits on a computer, doesn't care about his children, not learning, not asking anything, not giving her attention, nothing. That's their marriage. All day she takes care of the kids and the work and whatever, cleaning. Then she hopes to be two, three hours sitting, eating dinner with her husband, smile, he's hug, kiss a little bit, sit together on the couch, talk about her and da, you know, whatever, telling her about what he learned, what she read, you know, do things together, take a walk, go eat ice cream together. That's a healthy marriage. Nothing. A bum. That's it. She, yeah, a puppet. She bought a puppet. If she has a husband here, put a puppet on a couch, she has a husband in the house. No. Then the Gemara continue. Amar Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. Come and see how great those who are down in the eyes of God. What does it mean, those who are down? Humbled. They make themselves down. In a time that Bet Amikdash exists, a person sacrificed Korban Ola, a sacrifice, he get the reward of the sacrifice of Ola in his hand. You made it, it's yours. You got your reward from Hashem. If he makes a Korban Mincha before the sunset, then he has Har Mincha Beyado. But if a person is humbled, he did not sacrifice any goat. Goat is about $300 today. You went to Bet HaMikdash, you took a day off, Oh, that's if you live in Yerushalayim. So, you know, a few hours you get there, you bring the goat. All day you wasted, you lost your salary of today, whatever, because you, you were busy with the korban. $300 you pay for the goat. So a few hundred dollars you gave, and Hashem gave you the reward based on how much you did. But a person that did not sacrifice anything, he didn't bring goat, he didn't take a day off, nothing, but he's down to earth. He's not a stuck-up person. For me, everyone is better than me. No one, I'm not better than anyone. He's better, she's better, everyone is better. The go is better, everyone. If you get yourself that I am less than the, the one I'm talking to, you're going to get safe from many problems in life. And the Gemara says, Someone who brings himself all the way down, It counts, that he sacrifice all kinds of sacrifices combined. Tens of thousands of dollars. Take all kinds of sacrifices. He went, stood on line, brought a goat. The goat, meh, come. No, I don't want to come. He pulled him, he, got, he runs, he has to get him again. He brings the goat on his head. It's hot. He goes all the way up to Bet HaMikdash. Then he see how the coins slaughter him, all the, all, all the blood. It's not exactly the best pleasure. No, one reward of one sacrifice. You down to earth, you humbled every day like you sacrificed all the sacrifices. Shenemar, how do we know? Maybe it's metaphoric. No. This is what it says. Zivchei Elohim Ruach Nishbara. The greatest, superb sacrifices is a broken spirit of a person. Shenemar. Lev nishbar venitke, a broken, down to hurt heart, Hashem never turned down. Ever. No matter who you are, you Haman, you have a broken heart, it makes great impression in your prayer. There's not the same a person that he's 
wealthy and healthy and happy, happily married. He, he see lights every second of his life. Uh, he cannot cry while he, when, he, when he pray. He's very, very happy. Oh, my life couldn't be better. When a person and his heart is broken because of his sin, because of his poverty, because of his situation, when he prays, he rocked the upper world. That's why the Torah says, if you have a rich and poor, you give the poor to be the chazan, not the rich. Uh, the, the rich one is thinking about how much his stock is making. The poor is thinking, will I have a piece of bread to eat in the next hour? Or I'm going to continue to hear my children scream in the house. One man was trying to teach his kid the first pasuk that we teach our children when they grow up. What is it? Torah, Tziva, Lanu, Moshe. Torah, Moshe, order the Torah to us. He got it from Hashem, and he ordered us to follow it. Morasha, Keilat Yaakov. Morasha means Yerusha, inheritance. Keilat Yaakov, for the nation of Jacob. The nation of Jacob inherit the Torah, and Moshe ordered us to keep it. That's, it. That's what we teach them. So the kids begin to understand who against who. Who is Moshe? Oh, he's the messenger of God. Good. What, what's with us with him? He gave us the Torah. No good. He ordered us to keep the Torah. This is a, so we, they begin to understand. No. So one month, every day he teaches his son. This one, his mind, his head is black. He doesn't learn. He said, what kind of stupid boy Hashem gave me? <laughs> one month, he didn't learn one sentence? Pshh. He's very upset. Then one day he walks in the street. In Israel, it's very common, even today. Even though Israel is a very advanced country, technology, high-tech, etc. But there's still very primitive things there. There's certain things that you're not sure where you are, in Israel or in Zimbabwe. Sometimes you get confused. Like, for instance, you see in the middle of Tel Aviv or in the streets, fancy cars, these people go, everyone dressed, nice. Beautiful trees, all of a sudden a horse with a carriage from, from 50 years ago, all broken pieces like this, with piles of watermelon. He walks like this with the horse, black the whole traffic. Then all the people from the, from the terraces, they all come, they say, oh, the, the watermelon man is here. They all come down and they start to buy watermelon. He cut it, he put it on a scale. Of course, he has a primitive scale from 50 years ago. You know, nothing electronic. Fine, that's a, So now he walks in the street, all of a sudden he hears, Avatiyah ala sakin, matok, matok. Very sweet. He see this little boy. Twice he heard the man screaming. He repeats the sentence. Avatiyah ala sakin. Say, you moron. One month I teach you to Ratzim Aladu Moshe, you're mute. Now you heard this Rasha screaming, Avatiyah. Right away, you know what he says? Ay, 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 that's not a good sign. Right away, he got nervous. He ran to the rabbi. He said, Rabbi, don't ask. I don't know, maybe this is Esav. You know, he hear Avodah Zarah, he wants to come out. He hear Torah, he doesn't want to come out. What's going on here? One man, nothing. So the rabbi said, no, you don't get it. We have a rule in life. The Torah taught us many secrets. One of the secrets is, when you speak to another person, you can only affect him, his feelings, his soul, his heart, his thinking, if the words that come out of your heart are real and they really come from the heart, not from the mouth. Some of the words come from the mouth. It doesn't have a root. It's like putting a tree in the ground without roots. It's not going to last. Yeah, here, beautiful words, nice words, make sense. No blessing. It won't make a change in his evil inclination. He stayed the same wicked guy. But when, he, when it hurts, when you feel the pain, like Hashem is feeling when he sees children, how they are mechalel Shabbat, how they dress on the street, how they talk, how they eat, and it hurts you, it burns your heart, no matter what you tell him, even you're not the greatest speaker, whatever comes out, since it comes from a good source, it makes an impact. So he said, 
When you told your son, Torah Tzivalanu Moshe, you're dying already to go back to your business. You have an obligation to teach your son Torah a little bit. So he said, hey, Torah Tzivalanu Moshe. No, repeat after me. You hope that he's going to say it after five minutes and you can go back to your nonsense. But that's not coming from the heart. It's just to get rid of it. This watermelon guy is thinking tomorrow it's my mortgage. How will I get the money? So when he screamed, he put all his pain. I said, I need parnasa to Avatiyah. I got to sell watermelons. If not, what my wife going to say tonight? How are we going to pay the rent? He puts all his pain in his screaming. Right the way it affected your son. You understand? Because it's coming from a broken heart. That's life. No, no matter what. You're not, you're not going to be able to do anything. This is the way it's working. So, the Gemara continue, the Gemara say, we still in Masechet Sota, Tanur Abanan, Sota Natna Enea Bemisha Enora Uila. A crooked woman, she's married, and she look at another handsome guy. Oh, what a nice guy. Who is this guy? She's a married woman. It's very popular today, unfortunately. What she wanted... The thing that she wanted, she can never have. And what she has in her hand, she also lost. If she went and made a scene with another man, what's the halacha? Her husband can never take her back. They have to get divorced. And the one who she made the scene with can never marry her. In Hebrew, we call it kereach from both sides. He's bald on both sides of the head. Some bald people, they borrow some from here and lend to the other side. <laughs> you understand? But some of them don't have what to borrow because they're bald on both sides. There's nothing to borrow. Where are you going to borrow? From your ear? It's not going to be. So there's nothing. So that means you lost your husband, you lost your boyfriend from both sides. <laughs> you know, it reminds me of a joke. It says, one father comes to his daughter and says, I'm warning you. I never want to see you getting married to two kinds of people. She says, yes, father. Never get married to redhead people and never marry bold people. So the daughter is thinking, she says, okay, redhead, I know they had temper, I understand. Makes sense, you tell me, you have a reason. But why bold people? She says, maybe they used to be redhead. <laughs> Don't take the risk. <laughs> All right. So it says like this. It says, what she wanted, she can have. The thing she had, she also lost. No, yafeh. There's a rule. Every person who look at something that it's not his and cannot be his. Right? Even the thing that you can have, you lost. This is what it is. Listen good now. A person is single and he is dying to get married. 24, 25, 26, 28, 38, 108. He wants to get married. Every day the same thing. Hashem, how long, how long? Take my car, take my house, give me a nice girl. No. Why doesn't get married? One of the reasons, he look at married a woman and he say, Ah, I wish she was mine. That's it. Ah, you chomed isha nesua? You know she cannot be yours. Why are you even looking at her? Not supposed to even look at her bichlal. Ah, you look at her and you want, Oh, I wish she would be mine. That, you know, I want to ask you a question. Why Kohen Gadol the most important person in the world. The high Kohen, the highest Kohen. He goes to Kodesh HaKodashim on Yom Kippur inside. Only he can go. Nobody in the world can do it. Why is not allowed to marry a widow and a divorced woman? What's the problem? He's 70 years old. His wife died. Another woman, her husband died. He wants to marry her. What's the problem? It's not a little kid. There's no Kohen Gadol, 19 years old. He's an old person. He works with his cane. 
is eight years old. He wants to marry a woman seven years old. She's a widow. What's the problem? No, we're not talking now wild, dirty thinking. We're talking, just want to be with a woman. She cooks for me, good, we talk, some different Torah, companion. Old people need somebody to talk to them. You know, one man, one old man put his apartment in Yerushalayim for sale. He put his apartment for sale. And uh, every day, 10 customers come, they see a big sign on the terrace. Sir, how much? $300,000. What? It's barely worth even two hundred. That's my price. Take it or leave it. But in the meantime, you know, negotiation, they argue, go like this every day. One Talmud Chacham rabbi came and he said, okay, listen, your apartment really worth 200. I'll give you 220 because I want this location. But forget about 300. Nobody will give you 300. Not a penny less, he said. Not a penny less. So the, the Talmud Chacham, the rabbi left. A year later, he happened to be in the same block. And he see the same sign still on. So this old man still, probably now he lowered his request. Hello? Yes, how are you? Yeah. How much is the house for? $300,000. So still? A year ago I came here. You told me 300 I told you nobody will give you. Now you, you still want, you don't give up? So the old man started to cry. Oh, Rabbi, forgive me. No, I don't, you don't, I don't have to forgive you. It's your right. You can ask a million dollars for your apartment. No, just a waste of time. He said, Rabbi, the house is really not for sale. So what do you mean it's not for sale? He said, I'm so lonely. I had nobody to talk to. So I, had, I thought to myself, what's, how people will come to visit me all day around, and I have somebody to socialize with. I make him tea, and I hear this guy, this woman, this man. People come, they look, I talk to them, they tell me a little bit news. I'll put a sign, the house for sale, all day for one year, Baruch Hashem, from morning to night, I kept myself occupied, great. But I didn't think that somebody will come twice. Now, I, now you got me now. Now I feel bad. I wasted your time twice. <laughs> so this Talmud Chacham sent a letter to Rav Zilberstein to ask him if the old man is making a scene or not by doing it. Because he's, he's called Gonev, Gonev Lev atzi, Gonevet Livot Atzibur. He's, he's Gonev Dat. He's Gneva Dat. It's, mis it's uh, deceiving, no, not deceiving, uh, not misleading. What's the right word? Uh, tricking, I don't know. Gneva dat. It's fooling a person. Onad, it's called onad, deceiving. So the answer is no. Uh, it's not a mitzvah, but it's not a sin. Why? Because every person that becomes old officially is considering the Jewish law sick. Yes, even if it's Shimon Peres that can play basketball for three hours in age 80, he's still considered sick. Go and check him. He has one problem. Tibidi, this, kidney, uh, you know, stomach. In that age, the Mercedes already has 500,000 miles. It's a Mercedes, but it's 500,000 miles, my friend. That's it. There's leaks, problem, rust. It has to be something. Chazaka... No offense to the older people here, but chazaka, certainty that they are sick with some kind of sickness. Knees, ankles, heart, cholesterol, who knows what. Uh, overweight, whatever you name it, right? Cain, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> so, so, so what do you, so, since he's a sick person, everyone is obligated to visit him. No sin. He make them make do mitzvot. I have a question about the answer of this Talmud Chacham. As one thing, you make a person do chesed, you present the mitzvah to him, and he grabs it. But deceiving him, tricking him, tell him, come, come, I want to take you to the beach. Come, come. Come, come, come. I'll take you to the beach. You see some to make scenes. Oh! Tap, you make a turn. He find himself inside the yeshiva. Beard, people screaming. 
גדל והתקדש לרבה. היי, hey, you told me to the beach, sit, be quiet. Now he's learning, because he's in Baris, you know, in Baris team in front of everyone. Are you allowed to do it to him or no? That's the question. Yes, yes. Well, of course, yes. You know, you know this Gemara, Rabbi Akiva, took a lot of money from the rich rabbi, Rabbi Tarfon. We're talking the greatest rabbi ever lived here. He told him, I'm going to buy from you a field, a real estate complex, a lot of money, real estate. Trust me, it's a good investment. Oh, he gave him a bag full of money. He went, so you made a deal for me? Yes, I bought it for you. When you want to go see it, you tell me, I'll take you. Rabbi Tarfon was learning Torah all his life. He didn't have time to see what he has. He was very, very rich. He had fields, servants, amazing. So, after a few years, we told him, by the way, all of a sudden I became curious. Can you show me the field that you bought for me a few years ago? He said, come, come, I'll take you to see. He took him to a yeshiva. He showed him, here is your investment. So what do you mean? So I took the money you gave me and I opened you this yeshiva. <laughs> I gave you money for a field, for real estate. You, bought, you made me a yeshiva? Imagine if it would happen today. What would happen to Rabbi Akiva if it would happen today? Throw him in jail. Huh? Throw him in jail. jail? Right away you would have to say Kaddish a minute later. <laughs> Rabbi Tarfon kissed him. Great. Thank you. <laughs> this is the kind of people we had. Ah, Baruch Hashem. Thank you. So why didn't tell him, give me, I want to open a yeshiva? Huh? That's already too, too much of a yetzerara. No, yes, not allowed, yes allowed. Kashe, business is rough. Right? That's it. Then the Gemara continues, time is almost running out, we have 10 more minutes, let's take advantage on it. The Gemara says like this, so if you're looking at something that is, cannot be yours, and you're homed, you're jealous, you want it for yourself, Things that are legally allowed for you, a different woman that she's not married, you would lose her also, because you wanted something that belongs to somebody else. Mida keneged mida. All the punishments of God is measure for measure. We found the snake that get, put his eyes in Chava. The snake fell in love with Chava, with Eve. Real love. Desire, not love, desire. Physical desire. Snakes are desired women, even today. The Gemara says if a snake runs after a woman to rape her, she has to take some kind of her clothes and throw it to the side. Because the snakes, they go by smell. And that will confuse him. She goes to the other side and she throws something to the other side and the snake will go, will go over her clothes, wrap it strongly, and you see how we stick to it for hours. Then in the old days, they used to put their bed inside buckets of water. Why? Because that's how the snake used to smell people. If a woman sleep on a bed, even though the bed is tall, they come, in the old days, they used to come to the house. You know how the old days houses were, right? So they go in, they go inside, and they go, they're looking for a woman in the house. They're not interested in all the male. So they go where the females are. So the bed of the female is to put inside water because when they come to there, they cannot smell anymore. The mother, also if a woman runs and a snake is after her, they're very fast. The snakes are very fast the way they move. If she's near a lake, she has to run quickly into the water. Once he gets to the water, he cannot smell anymore. You understand? It's very interesting. So the first snake, before Hashem chopped his, his hand, his, his, his legs, he looked like a crocodile with many legs. He was able to stand and hug and everything. It's mystical things here. Don't ask me now question how exactly it was, just get the point. The point was that he, he puts his eyes on Chava, that she's a married woman. She's married to Adam. The thing he wanted, he didn't get, obviously. What he had was taken away from him. Why? Because he was supposed to be the king of all the animals. 
He lost the title and he went to the lion. You understand why we have Lion King? He, used, he had, was supposed to be the snake king. But the snake became mud eater. Everything he ate tastes like mud. From being a king, the king of all animals, and Genesis 3, you are the most scarce animal from all the animals in the field. Every animal exists. There are two million different kinds of animals that we know today, and he's the worst. And who is also worse? Who is another one? Dog. Dog. And who's the best animal? Donkey. Donkey. Oh, yeah. Good. Very good. You remember. Then it says, he was supposed to walk very proud on his legs. I put him all the way down on the floor to, to crawl with his face to the ground. Al gechono yelech. He was supposed to eat like people the most delicious food, shish kebab, apples, bread, whatever he wants to eat, he can eat. What does he eat now? Everything he eats tastes like mud. In case you doubt it, make an experiment. Take something delicious, like a, for, for snakes, a rat. Take a rat, kill him, and put him in front of a snake and take another rat and kill him and take, take mud and uh, pieces of material, dirty material, and wrap the rat with all the dirt. Put them both in front of him and you see how he eats the one with the mud, it doesn't bother him, even though there's clean one. Because he doesn't feel any way the difference between the rat and the mud. You had desire to the woman, now you're going to have hate between you and her. And between your descendants to her descendants. And this is what we found in Cain that wanted something that wasn't his. And he lost it. Korach. Korach wanted to be the king. He lost everything. Bilam, Doega Edomi, Achitofel, Gechazi, Avshalom, Adonia, Uziahu, Haman. They wanted things that wasn't theirs, and in the end they, le they lost everything they had. Shimshon followed his eyes. He looked at this beautiful Goya, Delilah. What was his end? The Hashem took away his eyes, became blind. They burned the knife until the knife became like fire and poked out his eyes. And then a minute after, he killed all of them, 3,000 of them in a stadium. He asked Hashem, do me just one last favor. So it was very strong. Help me to knock down these poles. And I'm, even though I'm going to die with all these filthy Philistines, but I'm paying for my sins, but let me take this revenge against them for what they did to me. And they knocked down the building and 3,000 of them buried and died, and that was his end. Then we have uh, Avshalom, the son of David Amelech. Avshalom had hair, hair. You know the kids today, you want to give them a haircut? Did you see how they cry? Not all of them, some of them. No, no, no. I know kids take haircut, they put their heads on the front because they want to bring it up. So they, that's how they take haircut. You offer him a hundred dollars to this poor kid, he doesn't have a penny. A hundred dollars? He won't agree to cut his hair. Why? The sitra achra, the impurity, all the bad is in the air. Call a judgment on a person. Ruins his whole luck in life. And he holds to it no matter what. Avshalom was very proud on his hair. Everyone has very short hair. Oh, hair, ponytail, hair, this, that. You know, all these people with the uh, afro. What was his end? They hung him from his hair. They took his hair and they hung him from the hair. No. Why? Because he made sins with the wives of his father. How to believe. Then, after they killed him, they stuck ten swords into his body. One for each girl. 
מידה כנגד מידה, תן. תן. שמשון, he said to his father, take her to me, I like her. Because he looked at a woman that he wasn't supposed to look at, they took out his eyes, מידה כנגד מידה. You made a sin with your eyes, your eyes goes first. When was the beginning of the sin of, Sh- of Shimshon, of Samson? In Aza, what we call today Gaza, the source of all evilness in the world, when the monster of universe living there. Right there. And the same thing was then in those days. And it's no coincidence that these murderers, which call themselves Palestinians, they call themselves after this nation who call Philistines. There's no connection. They're not their descendants. There was this empire called Philistines, and now they call themselves Palestinians, which is very... And they sit in the same city, Aza. Always was a source of evilness. Cursed. It's a cursed place. Amazing, amazing, a cursed place. Since he started to make a scene, he saw the woman in Aza, his problem began in Aza. Shenemar, Vayelech Shimshon Azata. Shimshon went to Aza, and he saw there a prostitute, a not modest woman. And right there, what does it say? Right after, Vayochazuhu Plishtim, Philistines grabbed him, and poked out his eyes. That's where you made the sin, that's where you're going to pay the price. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, it's better for a person to throw himself into the furnace, into the fire, to die, than to embarrass your friend in front of public. And not your friend, any person. You know, you embarrass him. Even a guy, what, well, you have permission to embarrass a guy in public? No. So he, here, is the, here is the thing here. What does it mean to embarrass your friend? Sometimes it's a joke. You see a bunch of friends, and uh, you say, oh, this guy, when he goes to sleep, he snores so loud. Almost everybody snores. There's no control of it. Some people are very embarrassed when you say that they snore. So if, if by saying that he snore in front of five other guys, that's like spilling his blood. You know, so there could be an embarrassment. You don't have to tell him, you're a thief. You never take a shower. That's even worse. All you have to do is, ooh, when you snore, it's like a carpenter with a sword. Something like that. Nagaria. Poor guy. You know, he doesn't show that he's offended, but... Who knows, you maybe spill this blood. How did we learn that? From Tamar. Yuda and Tamar. Yuda is about to execute Tamar. She takes the cane and the ring, and she said, do you recognize it? And he said, yeah, she's right. I was the one who was with her. This is mine. She's innocent. She's right, and I'm wrong. She didn't say, who are you to judge me to death? You're the one who was my partner to the crime. You are my judge? She didn't embarrass him. She said, if he will admit, fine. If he won't admit, I'll jump into the fire, they're killing me, and I won't say a word. The one who made the sin with me is judging me to death. Execution. And if she didn't say, hey, Yuda, you have the nerve to judge me? The only reason I made the sin is because of you. She didn't make a beep. She said, do you recognize this? Nobody knows what it is. He could have said, no, what's that? Pretend he doesn't know. Save his ego. A minute later, she's dead. Finished. Judges today do this. But Yehuda was a tzaddik. That's why we call Yehudim. Because of that thing, Yehudi, Modeh. He admitted. Yehuda means Leodot, to admit. His name shows what he is. Many times the name... Testify, who are you? By your name. So he said, Tzadkami Meni, she's right. Yosef, Kideshem Shamayim Basetar, sanctify the name of Hashem 
in hidden rooms. Hashem added one name to him, Yehosef. Where does it say Yehosef? In Tehilim. Edut be Yehosef Samo. The hey of Hashem was added to his name. Yuda sanctified the name of Hashem in public. His name after Akadosh Baruch Hu. When the time Yuda admitted, we have Mamash another minute. When Yuda admitted, there was an echo in heaven. You saved Tamar and her two children from a, from a furnace. I will save three of your children from this furnace. Who? Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And they fell into the fire. Hashem got them out of there alive. Mida keneged me. Everything is it's beautiful how it works. Mamash routine. Formula. This formula is like math. Two plus two will always be four. It's no surprises. The more you learn Torah, the more you see how everything falls and connects together. Miriam was waiting for Moshe Rabbeinu to see who's going to grab him. When she, be, when she became le, 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 with leprosy, they waited for her one week. They were supposed to continue to walk. The whole nation is waiting for one woman. Leave her with the horse. And let her follow you. If she finds us, fine. If not, let her die. What can we do? Everybody sit and wait for her. Why? Hashem say, you were waiting next to Moshe when you put him in a Nile, in a box. You were hiding to see. You, you hid. They were waiting for you now. Mida keneged mida. It's amazing. Or Yosef. Yosef. Had the, the Mary to bury his father Yaakov. He went all the way from Egypt to Nablus, to Shechem. It's a long journey. It's 11 days walking. So he took his father to bury him. The Torah say, And Bechav Gadol Mi Yosef. Yosef is the greatest, bri- the, gre- the greatest tribe from all of them. Shenemar Vayal Yosef Likvor et Achiv. Vayal Imo Gam Rechev Gam Parashim. Milanu Gadol Ke Yosef, who was the one who buried Yosef? Moshe Rabbeinu. Nobody else. You buried Yaakov, even though you're the king of Egypt. Who's going to bury you? The king of the world. Moshe Rabbeinu. Wow, what's the problem? Moshe could have said, hey, Yitzchak, Avram, Yaakov, come, come. Hop, take him, take care, make sure you make him beautiful funeral. I'm busy. I'm Moshe Rabbeinu. Imagine you see a guy today. Chas v'shalom, he died young. Who comes to bury him? Rav Ovadia Yosef. Nobody touch him. I'm the one. Takes the shovel. I say, oh, what's going on here? Rabbi, let them move. We'll do the job. No, here, we bring few Arabs. They'll dig the grave. And we'll make a funeral. No, no, no. It's my mitzvah. I do it. Everybody understands, oh, this person is important. Rabbi came to bury him by himself with his own hands. Has to be somebody important. I everything measure for measure. Vayikach Moshe et atzmot Yosef imo. Moshe took the body of Yosef with him. Everyone was busy collecting jewelry and money, and he takes the body of Yosef and bury him. That's it. This is it, you see. Whatever you cook, you eat in the end. And it's not only Moshe or Yosef or this. It's all the tzadikim, all the righteous people. Sheneemar, prophet Yeshaya say, Isaiah 58, Your righteousness is always walking in front of you to open the doors for you. Tzidkecha. I'm going to tell you one last quick story for you to, you know, since we got to this topic. About uh, a week or two before Pesach, I went to Canada, to Toronto. I had, a, Baruch Hashem, a good lecture there. When I finished the lecture, quickly the next morning, I went back to the airport, on the way to the airport. Now, as you can see in my computer, you have a sticker, divineinformation.com, a ticket to eternal life. I'm sitting in a terminal, I have a regular seat, economy. I sit and I walk on my computer. I see every Jew walks, in the big terminal in Toronto. Every Jew walks by, comes like this and reads, and is thinking, what's this? Then all of a sudden, the guy who is in charge of the whole flight, you know, the one who announced, please come, flight number such and such, he's in charge over there. He comes to me, says, oh, divineinformation.com, a ticket. 
for eternal life, what is it? I started to tell him, so what are you doing here? I came, I gave lecture, where? Thornhill, Toronto, fine. We, we, we're becoming friendly now. I give him my card. Now, I don't know as a Jew, non-Jew. He showed interest. I give him my card. I say, you can listen to some lectures there. You have interesting lectures. I give him the card. About a minute later, he comes to me. Sir, give me your boarding pass. Put me first class. <laughs> this is what it is. And you do something Hashem is happy with. That something walks in front of you and opens the doors for you. Now you think it's over. I get on the plane. I get a nice couch. I will never dare to sit in first class, even if it costs $5 more. But we got it for free. What do I care? I sit. <laughs> I have less headache. Fine, I sit over there. Then the woman, one woman in charge of nine chairs. That's it. Nine chairs. Six on this side and three on this side. She comes to me and says, it's not fair. He got your card and I didn't get your card. I said, oh, you heard? Yeah, yeah, I heard. Divine information. What? Apparently she's a Jew who used to live for a year or two in Tel Aviv. She speaks Hebrew, French accent. Over there it's all French, French and English. She speaks speak Hebrew. Shalom, this, that. Glad kosher sandwich, this. <laughs> like you went to a five stars restaurant. <laughs> It's too bad, it's only an hour and a half, the flight. <laughs> you know, I say, why it didn't happen when I go to L.A.? Over there, it's a nightmare. So, or to Israel, 11 hours in a plane. But, who knows now? They got the card, they went, they listened to lecture, they changing. The, you never know. One thing leads to another. We'll see you next Wednesday, Bezrat Hashem. Monday, I'm going to be in the uh, 73rd and, uh, and, uh, and 172nd in Fresh Meadow, every Monday. 8.30 over there, and every, every Wednesday, 8.30 over here. Next week, I'm going to ask them to pray upstairs so we won't have a delay like today. Thank you very much. Thank you.